Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Bent Limbs Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Thiel King. Guys, it's been a while since we've done one of these. I'm sorry it's been so long. I think you guys know that you know, this podcast isn't a regularly cadenced podcast like a lot of other ones, but it's certainly one that I enjoy doing. And with hunting season you know, approaching quickly right around the corner, uh, this is one I wanted to do. And this is one that was inspired by one of you guys out there. Ken Ferguson, I hope you're listening because this one's for you. And Ken is from Ireland, which I thought was so cool. I, honest to God, you guys, I did not think when I started this YouTube channel, whatever it was, four or five years ago now, um, that I would have somewhat of an international audience. Like that would not have even crossed my mind at all. So I think it is so cool that there are people not only watching and listening in the US, but people in other countries. Uh, that enjoy some of the stuff that we're talking about or or that I'm showing you guys. So I, I just think that's awesome. And I just want to say thank you to all of you. I love all you guys, wherever you're at in the United States or across the world. Thank you for all of your support. So Ken, in episode two, he had listened to and he had commented and asked on YouTube, um, what broadheads are you using? the the favorite topic of every hunting platform magazine tv show you name it um this has been covered a ton and and i kind of wanted to take a little bit of a different approach because i don't want to just tell you guys this is what i'm shooting and you should go shoot it i don't think it's quite that simple i think a lot of it depends on you who are listening right now, it really depends on you. And, and the way I kind of thought about this, and I hope this helps you guys, is I kind of broke it out into a series of questions that we're going to go through. And I want you guys to answer honestly. You can write them down. You can just answer in your head. You can do it however you want. Um, but we're going to go through a few questions, answer them honestly, and then unpack each one. And after that, I'll kind of talk about how I answer the questions, my experiences with different broadheads, uh, successes and failures, and then we'll go into what I shoot and why I shoot them. So before we dive into that, I want to just do a couple or I, really one quick announcement. Um, if you haven't already seen it, we're doing a crossbow giveaway here September 1st. So our good friends at Killer Instinct have been really generous and have offered up a Vital X to one of the Dragon Deer and Killer Instinct followers. So there's a video on the Dragon Deer channel. You guys go check that out. It's going to explain exactly what you need to do to enter to win that. It's completely free to enter. And, um, you know, I've got a, another video too on the Vital X, a review video. Uh, check that out because it's a sweet little bow, you guys. It's narrow. It's got KI's basically top cam technology in their X cam system, uh, but packaged into a really, uh, you know, affordably priced crossbow. Um, it's a, it's a sweet bow. I think whoever wins it out there, you guys are really going to like it. So don't miss out on that opportunity. Go watch that video, follow the instructions and make sure you are entered to win that. And again, we'll be announcing that winner on September 1st. So guys, I don't know what time it is where you're at. It is 8:30 here on August 9th in Southwest Michigan. If we're diving into the broadhead rabbit hole, I'm going to drink a nice cold beer. If it's the morning for you, coffee, whatever your drink of choice is, let's kick back, relax a little bit, and talk broadheads. So before we even start, and this is going to be item number five, we'll come back to this, is what I want for you all out there. doesn't matter whether you're shooting a compound bow, doesn't matter if you're shooting a crossbow, doesn't really matter how far you want to shoot, how short you want to shoot your poundage, any of that stuff. The biggest thing is I want you to be confident. I want you to know exactly what you're getting into. I want you to know the positives and negatives of whatever broadhead or whatever arrow system, honestly, the whole package, the arrow and broadhead that you're getting into. And I want you guys to just have 100% confidence when you're out in the woods. So we'll get back to that. But question number one for how to go about selecting a broadhead is what level of bow and arrow tuning are you willing to do? Uh, if you're a crossbow shooter, you know, the bow tuning aspect isn't as, um, 
I don't know, it's certainly not important, but you don't have to go through a lot of the bow tuning efforts like you do with a compound just because you are removing a lot of the human factor when you're shooting a crossbow. But for either platform, compound, or crossbow, arrow tuning can certainly play a role in your arrow flight and broadhead performance. So just answer this honestly. Are you willing to do it? Are you willing to do some? Are you willing to do a lot? Um, so that would, I guess, be item A. Are you willing to do bow and arrow tuning to optimize your broadhead flight? Or honestly, is that just not something that interests you? Is that something that you haven't found value in? Is that something that you just don't have time to do or don't understand? That's totally fine too. That would be option B, that you that is just not something that you do or think is important or you know maybe you just don't have time to do it. So question one. What level of bow and arrow tuning are you willing to do? Question two is, do you care or do you have concerns about how an animal reacts when it's shot? And kind of along with that, um, what I'm trying to think of how to frame this is kind of, uh, are you very concerned, if you want to call it that, on like your blood trail levels? So this is kind of a, this is, this is one we'll unpack here in a minute. Um, but where I'm going is, you know, do you care how far animals go after you've made, like, let's just say a good shot. Okay. We're not talking about bad shots. We're talking about good shots. Do you care how they react? Do they care? Do you care how far they go? Um, and do you care how much blood they lay down? So if you do, if you want a lot of blood, um, or you can say no, I guess, for item A. No, don't really care how the animal reacts, um, but I do want a big blood trail. So that would be item A. Or you can say, yes, I do care how the animal reacts. And honestly, I'm not that concerned about laying down a big blood trail. Again, I know this is kind of a weird question. This is a question that... it. it it's unpredictable, right? How the deer is going to react and, and how much, uh, blood you're going to get. doesn't really matter what, um, yeah, I would say it's unpredictable. Let's just say that it's unpredictable. You, you cannot predict exactly what's going to happen after that arrow, uh, hits the deer and how it reacts and how much blood it puts down. Um, or that can just vary shot to shot, animal to animal. Um, but I'm, what I'm trying to do here, and I think you guys can see that is I'm trying to make a couple buckets for you. So again, do you care how the animal reacts and do you care what the blood trail looks like? If you say item A, no, don't really care how the re animal reacts, but I want a lot of blood. You would check A. If you say, yeah, I do care how the animal reacts after it's hit, but the whole having to have a big red carpet blood trail, I don't really need that. Uh, that would be item B. Number three, what shot angles do you typically take or do you feel comfortable taking? Um, and this can be both the animal and how the animal is positioned, you know, broadside versus quartering two and quartering away, right? I would say, do you feel comfortable taking uh, shots on quartering two, quartering away animals? Um, and let's, let's picture those quartering two, uh, quartering away as, you know, some decent angle to that animal that you're hunting. But I also want that angle piece to be, do you normally hunt elevated or on the ground? Um, let's kind of put it that. So item A, if you want to check for this question would be, yep, I, you know, I'm okay taking uh, shots at sharp angles, be it the animal or basically be it from shooting from high up from a tree stand or item B, uh, I feel more comfortable taking shots with less angle slash I hunt at lower elevations or I hunt on the ground. That would be B. So that is question three is what shot angles do you feel comfortable taking? Question four, this is really the meat and potatoes when it comes to selecting a broadhead is when plan, when the plan B scenario happens, what are you most worried about? And you could frame this up too on when you miss, if you have a miss, um, how do you miss? So I want you to think of this question, not as you just 
you know, your target buck comes out. He's feeding in your food plot. He's perfectly broadside. He's well within your comfortable shooting range and you 10 ring him. You, I mean, you just, you put it exactly where you want it. That is not what this question is. This question is when the animal moves, when maybe you're nervous and you're a little flinchy and you pull a shot. Maybe it's even like there was a little twig you didn't see it and you release that arrow and there's a little bit of a deflection, right? That's plan B. That's where you are not hitting where you plan to hit. Something went wrong. What are you most worried about when that something goes wrong? Item A is hitting bone slash lack of penetration. So if you are most worried about, I'm going to be in heavy bone. Um, and that's basically something, not ribs, right? That's Shoulder blade, we're going to consider shoulder blade a heavy bone for this. That spine, that might be, uh, you know, the, the front leg bone. Um, are, you more, are you most worried about hitting something heavy and having poor penetration? That would be item A. Item B would be, are you worried about hitting back? Are you worried about hitting in the liver, guts, intestines? Okay, that would be item B. And then finally, question five is back to kind of where we started is what brings you confidence? Just write something down or think about something like what, when you've got a, whatever broadhead it is on the end of your arrow, what about that particular broadhead and think about it? What about that makes you confident that you're going to have success? So those are the questions. Those are the five questions that I hope you guys have answered. It'd be really cool if you have at this point, you know, really quick, pause this podcast if you want to, or just put them down in the comments section, because I would love to hear what you guys think as we go through and unpack and I can give you my answers. Okay. So question one, let's unpack that is what level of bow and arrow tuning are you willing to do? So this comes down to a flight thing. Um, and what, I think you guys are probably picking up on a little bit is where I'm trying to distinguish for you, whether you would be more confident with a fixed blade or a mechanical. So if you answered a, that you are willing to do, you know, levels of bow and arrow tuning that are going to help your both arrow and broadhead fly the best. Um, you can really shoot, you know, whatever you want. Uh, and some broadheads are going to fly better than others. That is just a given. They're all built a little different. They're all a little more aerodynamic or some are a little more aerodynamic than others. Uh, some have less drag. Some just shoot better than others. But on a well-tuned system, a well-tuned system versus a not as well-tuned system is going to show major discrepancies um, broadhead to broadhead. So if you're willing to put in the time and effort, which I highly recommend and I do, I take a ton of, you know, just, I guess, pride and joy, or I have a lot of fun doing it. Um, and it makes me feel so much more confident when I've got a really well-tuned setup. So I like doing a lot. I would answer a on this. And if you answered a, you like doing that, you can honestly, you can shoot a fixed blade or a mechanical and you're going to have good flight. If you answered B where it's like, you know, that really isn't something that I'm into. I don't have time. I've never done it and I've had success. Um, you know, whatever it is, that, that's totally fine too. Okay. Just be honest with yourself. That's where you're going to, you're going to be better off from a flight perspective, shooting a mechanical broadhead because mechanicals are just in, inherently, they are more aerodynamic because they have less blade profile protruding from the ferrule compared to a fixed blade. So if that's not something that you're interested in doing, you answered B you um, would probably lean more towards mechanical when it comes to this question, question one. All right, question two. <laughs> this is the kind of loaded question that I probably did a poor job of framing up for you guys. But uh, do you care how an animal reacts to the shot? And basically, do you care about the blood trail? Uh, I think all of us want, you know, the animal not to react much at all and, and dump out a bunch of blood. Right. I mean, that's the ideal scenario and that can 100% happen. That can have, that can happen with, uh, with fixed blades or mechanicals, but I mean, it, you know, it does, it varies a ton and there's little we can control with this, but where I was going with it is if you really don't care how the animal reacts, like if you just care, as long as I, you know, if I hit my mark, I really don't care if it's, if it storms off, 
you know, if it runs a hundred plus yards. Um, but what I do want is I, I want to be able to follow a, an easy blood trail, right? Um, I think that would lend more toward the mechanical side. Um, so my experience has been when deer are shot with mechanicals and you've got that really big cutting diameter and really kind of a, like a steep blade profile, um, blasting through their rib cage, they react, um, pretty, you know, uh, surprised a lot of adrenaline, like they react by basically storming off through the woods. Even if you, you know, hit exactly where you want, they often go pretty far, at least in my experience. And what, what a lot of that I've seen either from my buddies or even like hunting TV shows. Right. But when you, when you put that big cutting diameter mechanical through an animal, um, you're going to, you're going to likely put down a pretty heavy blood trail just because you're opening up a big hole. Right. So if you don't really care how far they run, as long as you can follow it, that would be item a, um, that would lend more to a mechanical. If you answered B or yes, I care how that animal reacts. Like I don't want them to react all crazy. Um, and I'm, I'm less concerned about how much blood he lays on the ground. I would just rather the deer react more calmly, not really know what happened and either fall in sight or fall within a shorter distance than the, what I would say a lot of mechanicals have happened. Basically item B is, is the fixed blade. You're leaning more towards a fixed blade. And, and that's been my experience. Okay. I've shot deer with mechanicals. I've hit them perfect. And they've laid down just a red carpet treatment of a blood trail. That's very easy to follow, but Many times I was surprised how far they took that. And, and I really think that is just the way they react to that shot, that adrenaline rush. Um, they can go pretty darn far. Um, 100 to 150 yards was m my typical mechanical recovery where I hit the deer well um, in the heart and lungs. On the flip side, uh, on a fixed blade, especially a fixed blade that you get really, really sharp. I'm talking like scary sharp. Um, the first year I ever shot with a really high quality, I, I shot it with a single bevel two blade that I sharpened to the best of my ability. And it was, I mean, it was really sharp and I shot a deer with it. I kid you not. I thought I missed, um, the deer took a couple hops and it just stood there and looked around. And I, I swear I thought I missed and he was really close. Um, and then he just tipped over. He just flicked his tail a couple times, got a little wobbly and he tipped over. So that is one where, you know, that deer, that really sharp kind of smaller broadhead, um, it zipped right through him and he didn't even really, it's not that he didn't realize it, but his reaction was, was not that he just got shot. Like it might more so be with a mechanical. It was like, I don't really know what happened. He's, stands there, gets woozy and tips over. So that's kind of how the, that's kind of how I was trying to tailor that you guys. I hope, I hope that makes sense. Um, so question two, do you care how he reacts? Do you care what the blood trails look like? A was don't care how he reacts. As long as I get a big blood trail, that's more mechanical leaning. Uh, B was, yes, I care how he reacts, but I'm, I'm not quite as concerned on the amount of blood that gets put down. That was the fixed blade. Okay. Number three, shot angles. What shot angles do you feel comfortable taking? So this is both on the animal and, uh, kind of your position relative to the animal. Okay. So sharp angles and elevated. So if you, um, if you feel confident taking that quartering two shot, if you feel confident and most of us do taking that quartering away shot. Um, and if you feel confident hunting from fairly high elevated stands. That was item A sharp angles slash elevated. That's going to lean more towards a fixed blade. Item B was mm, no, I, I like just broadside or minor angles. And my elevation is relatively low, like a, a low tree stand, maybe like an elevated box blind or just a ground blind. Um, you could certainly 
still shoot a uh, fixed blade in that type of scenario too. Uh, but that is more the mechanical leaning one. And here's why. Um, those sharp angles, um, what can happen is you can have basically a, a redirection of flight with a mechanical. Um, I've actually had, well, I think I had this happen because I didn't recover a deer, but on those sharp angles, you guys, when the blades, when your blades have to open, if they don't open at the exact same time, if one starts to open and maybe starts cutting before the other, what can happen is that arrow can kind of redirect its path. Um, same thing too with the sharp angle thing. The sharp angle, you've just got uh, the, the elevated, I'm talking sharp angle. You've got more of a chance of hitting that heavy bone. Uh, you got more of a chance shooting down at a deer, especially if they're close and you're up really high. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's easier to hit the shoulder blade and the spine with an angle like that versus being on the ground. So if you're going to take, or you feel comfortable taking those angled shots, whether it's the animal's position, or if you like to be really elevated, that's where I think that lends itself more towards a fixed blade, because basically a fixed blade is going to have less of a chance of skipping or redirection, and it's going to have a better chance of going through and breaking bone and getting penetration. If you are at less of a elevated angle on the ground, low elevation, or you just don't like taking those type of shots, you like a broadside deer, that's where you can really choose. You can shoot a mechanical or a fixed. And, that, and those are the type of angles that lend itself to a mechanical. And the kind of the story I was uh, referring to you guys is I took a quartering away shot. Um, I honestly wasn't very high up and it was like 20 yards and it wasn't a real sharp quartering away shot, but it, it was decent. And my arrow, I, as I was watching it fly, it was going right where I wanted it to. And then when it hit the deer, um, you know, he reacted a little goofy. And as he was basically kind of bounding off, I noticed that the arrow one didn't get much penetration and two, it was, it was running like parallel to his body, like the angle at which it was at and how far it was sticking out. Like it looked like you'd almost like taped the arrow to the side of him. Um, and that would, and it was not that sharp of a shot. Long story short, it was a single lung hit on a pretty nice buck. That was a blood trail that was, there was a lot of blood, but we went a very long ways and, uh, and did not recover that deer. Um, it was a mile and a half track job where we bumped him multiple times and we were purposefully bumping him to try to get him to, to bleed out or get to a point where we could get another shot at him. He just never did. So my thought is that was an expandable, um, is that the blades opened not at the same time and that arrow redirected and basically didn't penetrate very far and kind of just ran up the one side of them and clipped the one lung. So that is, you know, question three. Um, and that kind of even segues into question four and what is your plan B scenario. What does that look like? What are you worried about or how do you miss? Okay. So if, if you're worried about hitting bone slash, you're worried about lack of penetration when that plan B, um, happens, that's fixed blade, uh, fixed blade, definitely going to have a better chance of getting through bone, breaking bone, getting better penetration, um, than a mechanical. If you're worried about hitting back, if you're worried about hitting liver, guts, intestines, where you're going through basically ribs or just soft tissue, that's going to lend itself to a mechanical. Just hitting those non-vital organs, being able to create a bigger wound channel, you're going to have likely a higher, uh, higher odds of recovery, putting that big cutting diameter through that area versus a fixed blade. Obviously, nothing's a guarantee, but that's kind of how we're bucketing these things. And then finally, you guys, what, what about your broadhead brings you confidence? Confidence is the most important thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you really got to just know exactly what you're getting into, the, the pluses and minuses, and knowing your shots, knowing what that broadhead's going to do well and what it's not going to do well, and just tailoring your hunts to it and being, you know, as confident as you can possibly be when that arrow flies, when it's going towards its mark, or if it gets off its mark, where, where it's going to... Um, where it's going to perform, how it's going to do for you as far as your success chances, 
and and just ultimately just having no doubt in your mind. I mean, having doubt in your mind, worrying about how something might fly, worrying if you're going to hit a bone, worrying if you're going to hit back, whatever it is, whatever brings you confidence, write that down. And hopefully that tailors itself to either that mechanical or fixed blade. Okay. So you guys, whatever it is, mechanical or fixed blade, however you, you know, basically chose or answered these questions. Um, hopefully that kind of helps guide you to one option. So I am, I am now, I shot mechanicals for a long time. Um, and I've, I've honestly killed more deer with mechanicals than I have with fixed blades. I shot some fixed blades early on as a kid and through college, uh, then shot mechanicals for, for a while. And, you know, I did have just a couple issues with mechanicals. Um, and now what brings me confidence is, um, penetration is penetration is structural integrity. Um, and and making sure that I do my part to make sure that that broadhead and that arrow flies well. Uh, if I do those three things, if I have a good flying arrow with a broadhead, like I know how well that arrow and broadhead combo shoot. Um, I've got something that's got good structural integrity. I've got something that's razor sharp, like really scary sharp. Um, then that is where my confidence is now. So really mechanicals when it comes down to, um, you know, what they do well. I mean, when they work, they work great. I mean, they, they put down massive blood trails. They create massive wound channels, but if you're worried about hitting bone, um, there's not a lot of mechanicals that can get through them consistently, um, or can get through them and still have blades intact that when you are through it, it's, you know, it's not just a, a pencil hole or a bunch of gummed up, bent up dull blades when it does get into the vital organs. That's, that's kind of what I saw, even with success, even with deer that I had killed. I, and I didn't really pay much attention to it at the time, but I had some mechanicals that like, they didn't hit anything hard, like rocks or a tree or anything like that. After they went through a deer, um, they were just in the dirt and they were, some were pretty chewed up. Some had busted blades. Um, some didn't penetrate very far. And when I recovered the deer, the blades were busted, but you know what, at the time I really didn't think anything of it. I was, I was killing stuff. And when I was, when they were working exactly how they should, and I was doing my part exactly how I should, man, they work great, but just know that they are, they are definitely much better at non-angled, you know, fairly square shots, um, where you're avoiding bones. So tailor your shots to that. If you're, if you're leaning mechanical where I like to lean now, because I have only shot ever one deer back. Um, and that was from a deflection deer that I have not recovered, um, or had, you know, kind of poor shots on have, have almost always been up and down. And, you know, I've had a few where you skim the brisket and you, you kick yourself, but you're not as, um, heartbroken. Cause you know, that deer is going to make it, but I have hit, I've hit shoulders. Um, I've hit spine. Um, I've had, you know, just stuff in the bone where it, had I had a quality fixed blade, maybe I would have got them. Maybe I wouldn't, but from a, you know, what worries me, my misses, my plan B's, what worries me is hitting, is hitting heavy bone and not getting penetration. Um, and the other, you know, the other thing that I really like now is, is how the deer react. Um, unfor I would say almost unfortunately, I find my, I think of myself as a, as a pretty darn good tracker. And I've got some buddies that are pretty darn good trackers too. And that's because we've been on some, you know, bad shots and, and crazy track jobs. And some we've ended up getting the deer and, and some we haven't, but I'm, I'm not as worried about how much blood gets put down on the ground. What I do like a lot more now is how the deer react less to the shot with that scary, sharp fixed blade versus a mechanical. Um, I hope that helps you guys, whatever it is that you choose, man, just be confident in it. So when it comes to, if I was going to make a recommendation, all right, let's say you're a mechanical guy. Um, if you want to know the ones I shot for a long time, it was the rage. Um, I shot rage chisel tip. So they were like the red ones with the chisel tip. And I always shot the two inch cut. I shot a couple with those rage extremes, the big two and a half ones. 
and those blades just seem to almost always get goobered up. Um, so I liked that the, the rage, um, the regular two blade was just a, not sorry, not the regular two blade, the regular two inch cut, but just seemed a little bit more robust. Um, <clears throat> I like that head. Um, I don't think it's the best one out there, but I think the blade deployment, the way that it does it, um, is good. I like the blades that are going to slide back. If you want to say, I don't know, some people say like open normally, not the jackknife style ones that are going to fold over the top. Um, so I, I do like the Rage. I think the Tripan, um, I know Rage has a couple now that are a little bit, a little bit more stout, a um, little higher quality materials and, and better ferrule and, and maybe even better blades. Um, so that is a good head. I think the king of mechanicals, this is, this would probably be, if I was going to shoot a mechanical, this would probably be the only one I would shoot now is the Sever. Um, I really like the Sever. Uh, from what I've seen on it, it is without a doubt, it seems like the most robust, the most durable, um, the most, you know, structurally sound mechanical out there. It's got great blade deployment. Um, same type of thing, you know, they're going to slide back. They lock into place, which I think is great. Um, they got a really nice tip on them. Uh, from what I've heard, the blades are really sharp. My buddy just got some and, and he's going to try them this year. They seem, they seem pretty sweet. And, you know, I don't know if you guys watch a lot of John Lusk um, on YouTube. I think his broadhead reviews are fantastic. I love how he compares some apples to apples. I would definitely recommend if you're looking to uh, pick a broadhead, watch some of his videos because you'll, you'll, you'll be able to narrow down um, kind of what you're looking for and, and see how those broadheads compare on his videos. And the sever, I mean, is hands down the best mechanical with how he tests. So that would be my recommendation. I like heavier broadheads. I like the heavier weights. You just get more material on everything. You get more ferrule, you get oftentimes thicker blades. Um, and I personally, man, I think the like inch and a half, 1.75. Um, I like the smaller cutting diameter ones just because I think they're, they're, they're still big enough. But if you do end up um, hitting some bone, you just have a better chance of getting through it with that smaller cutting diameter of that mechanical versus the really, really big ones. So that would be my recommendation. If you're going mechanical, take a look at the sever. As far as fixed blades, um, I've shot a lot of really good ones. There's a lot that I like. Um, what is in my quiver last year, and it will be the same this year. First, we'll start with, um, you know, one of the toughest heads I think that I've shot, and that is the uh, Tough Head Evolution. It's a three blade. It's 150 grand. So the Tough Head Evolution three blade 150. The reason I really like this head, it is made out of some super high quality steel. It's S7 tool steel. So the two, it's a really, really tough steel. It holds an edge really well. Um, and then I... I like the three blade in that um, because it's really easy for me to sharpen. So I love single bevels. I do. I think they work great. And, um, you know, the couple deer that I've shot with them, it's performed well. I haven't ever hit bone with a single bevel, but I just struggle sharpening them. Um, I do. That, that's just to be perfectly honest. So I'm giving up some of the penetration ability of, and, and, you know, true bone breaking ability of that single bevel for the three blade, but I can get the three blade much sharper. So that is what I'm shooting on my compound. That's what I shot on my compound last year. Uh, I killed a buck with that arrow last year on kind of a plan B type of thing. Um, and it performed very well. Uh, so I really like that head. Um, again, you guys, there's a lot of really good single bevels out there. Uh, Sirius makes some really good ones. Um, VPA, I like their heads. Um, what else is out there? The Bishop stuff or the Grizzly Stick stuff. Uh, single bevels are, as far as going through bone goes, I don't think you can beat them. I mean, they really are the, the best as far as being able to break bone, get through it, um, and, and get into the vitals and, and do it consistently. I mean, that's kind of the, you know, the story of Ed Ashby and um, all of his studies was, was single bevels, kind of long, skinny profile, single bevels are really, I mean, single bevels in general. Now, even some of the smaller ones, they're going to do a really good job breaking bone. 
just make sure you can sharpen and get really good at sharpening them. That was something that I just couldn't do. And, you know, I really do like this tough head evolution three blade because of how sharp I can get it. Now, those type of broadheads, those solid machined steel broadheads with really high quality steel, as sweet as they are, and I do love them, they are not cheap. Um, you can obviously reuse them as long as you find them. Um, you're going to be able to resharpen them a ton. I mean, and they'll pay for themselves as long as you don't lose them. But obviously, it's not a guarantee that you're going to get that broadhead back. So the one, like my gold standard broadhead, and again, they all have positives and negatives. There is no perfect broadhead. But to me, the gold standard is the Magnus Stinger. I love the Magnus Stinger. Every time I try to find something to replace it, I, I can't because it is to me the best it is the best flying fixed blade that i've shot hands down that's compound and crossbow um i like the 150 grain it's it's not as tough it's not the toughest broadhead out there but it's a darn tough one and if you watch john lust stuff he just did one on the is a two blade magnus killer b buzz cut so the non-vented one um I shoot the Magnus Stinger 152 blade, the vented, so it doesn't have the bleeders. But watch what that Killer B does in his video and how it handles like the cinder block and all that kind of stuff. I mean, they are they are freaking tough. Um, they're not expensive. They have a lifetime warranty. So if you break them, you can send it to Magnus. They'll send you another one. Um, they check a ton of boxes for people. Um, and really, I mean, still to this day, I think the biggest thing that surprises me, even for a fairly large profile broadhead is how well those things fly. I mean, they, they are crazy accurate. Um, I don't want to say they fly exactly like a field point because I don't think every broadhead does, but they are well within my margin for error where when I shoot it, it's, it's going basically right where I'm aiming out to 60 yards. That's how far I've shot those things. They are just they're awesome and they're whatever 30 35 bucks for three of them so that would be my recommendation if you're not if you don't want to break the bank if you don't want to go the really um expensive premium type of fixed blade type of the you know broadhead um definitely take a look at the magnus stinger there's a lot of other good ones too i've heard really good things from slick trick um those i know fly really well um what else have i shot the single bevel that I was shooting for a while was a cutthroat um, that, you know, killed a couple deer with that. It performed well. I just wasn't confident, again, in my sharpening abilities. Um, VPA, I already said that. They make good ones. Um, I like I like a two blade if you can. I don't know if you follow Ed Ashby's stuff. Two or four blade. So if you do go through heavy bone, it's easier to split heavy bone. Um, the two blade is the best. Two blade single bevel, even you know, the best of the best, um, but it's easier to split bone with a two blade. And then next is a four because it's easier to split bone at 90 degree angles versus like the three blade, which is 120 degree angles. So, uh, I do like two blades better. Um, but man, that, that, uh, that tough head evolution three blade is pretty sweet too. There's a lot of other good stuff, you guys. Um, but really, Again, I'm going to hammer home confidence. Just be honest with yourself. Uh, there might be more questions too that you ask yourself when you analyze broadheads. If you got them, please throw them down in the comments below. If you ask other people, you know, really kind of dig in deep. Make sure they're not just telling you, oh, you should shoot whatever it is. Rages because they're the best. They put down the biggest blood trail, blah, blah, blah. Dig into them a little bit and see what it is that, that they really... Um, care about or, or when you're listening to people talk see how they analyze their broadhead see if they kind of know the positives and negatives see if they know what they what that broadhead excels at and, and what you know what it can do and, and kind of where its weak points are and making sure that you don't put that broadhead in that situation um don't just take everybody's word for it everybody's got different experiences but try to figure out from those experiences what got them to that broadhead point, ask them these questions, you know, ask your hunting buddies, these type of questions, gather that information 
uh, absorb as much information as you can. And, and I mean, seriously, you guys, you don't have to just take the broadheads that I mentioned on here. Um, do some do some digging on your own and ultimately get to that that system, that arrow broadhead system that makes you the most confident. That is what I want in your quiver this fall for the 2023 hunting season. If you got that, if you know the ins and outs of that head, how it flies and where it excels and where it has uh, some areas that lack, you are going to be um, set up for success come this fall. So guys, that's what I've got for this episode of the Bentlands podcast. Ken, thank you again for kind of posing this question. If you guys have other episodes, I'd love to do a couple more of these as hunting season approaches. So throw those down in the comments as well. I'll do my best and, and you know, time permitting and some of the other videos and stuff. Uh, if I see one I like, I'll pick it and make sure if yours gets picked to give you a shout out just like I did to Ken. Um, but thank you guys for listening. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, be safe out there. God bless. And we'll see you on the next Bentlands podcast episode. Take care, everybody.